big welcome to tonight's second free webinar with Dr. Lou Casalino. A big welcome, Lou. Good to be here with you, Lou. Nice to see you again. Um, tonight's webinar is a prelude to February's webinar series, The Making of a Therapist. And Mary, what you might do is you might put up the link, please, for anybody that's signing up to the February series. And before we start, Lou, we just go through a few practicalities just to make tonight as easy as possible. The first is usually your own tech. Um, if anybody has any tech issues, what we suggest is that you'd log off and log back on using the link provided. And if the issues persist, what we suggest is that you contact Mary. And Mary's email is mary at pcpsi.ie. And I think you're going to give plenty of time tonight for questions and answers, Lou. So mm -hmm. if anybody has any questions, there's two ways we do it. We'd love people to come on live and interact with Lou directly. So if you want to do that, what you need to do is put up your yellow hand function, which is under the reactions button. And as I look at the screen, it's on the right hand side. But again, if you don't want to come on live, feel free to send a question in through the Q&A function. What we suggest is don't use the chat function for questions because we might miss your question and we'd hate to do that. And tonight we have a panel. So there's a big welcome to Kira, to Brendan, to Helma, to Brenda, Carly and Robert. And then tonight as well that Marie and Robert are in the background. And as everybody knows, these webinars wouldn't happen without Mary and Robert. So a big thanks to Mary and Robert that keep every keep the show on the road, really, Lou. So I think that's it. Um, I'll hand over to you, Lou, and you can you can take it off from there. Sure. Thank you, Liam. I'm very happy to be with all of you today, uh, this evening. It's um, kind of late morning for me. I'm in Los Angeles, um, and happy to do this uh, to be working with. Uh, you know, with uh, with Liam and his group to bring you all some of the things that I'd love to share with you. Over the years, uh, if, you, if you're if you familiar with my work, a lot of it has been in the area of interpersonal neurology. And I've, uh, after being trained early in my career in a variety of different um, modalities of therapy, uh, psychodynamic, family systems, cognitive behavioral, uh, humanistic existential, I was really fortunate to be at a university where there were experts in all of these different areas. And I just worked my way through doing two or three years with each of them. Um, and um, also ended up doing a, a kind of uh, self-study in neurology in the neurology department at UCLA. And so over the years, I haven't really become a devotee of any particular model, but I have tried to integrate different models and bring my uh, bring my knowledge to bear. I've never found that anything I've learned that is uh, legitimate and solid was in any way detrimental to anything else I've learned. So it's been cumulative and uh, and uh, a great experience for me. I'm, I feel very fortunate having had a, a life with so much learning and so, much, uh, so many resources around me. But uh, what I've noticed and the reason, the motivation behind um, setting up this uh, seminar series with, uh, with Liam and, and uh, CPSI is that as I've been supervising my students and even um, uh, therapists that are at a point now where they're, they're senior therapists and they're supervising, when I've done supervision at all different levels, what I've noticed is while people are interested in what I, you know, my thinking or what I have to say about um, the integration at a higher level, you know, for example, neuroscience and biology and psychotherapy, that I've kind of I've kind of observed that a lot of the basics of psychotherapy, the things that I've been trained to do, especially at the beginning of my career, um, sort of feels like they've fallen by the west the wayside. I suspect, and uh, you know, again, we all uh, we're all over the world, and so we have different experiences with training. But what I've seen in um, in my neck of the woods has been that there are there's less and less practical training and integration of theory into practice. There are uh, far fewer hours of supervision, far fewer hours of individual supervision. And a lot of the supervision my, experience, my students experience is more in groups and crisis focused, as opposed to really teaching the fundamentals. 
And so I, what I found is that uh, young students or new, new therapists need to learn the, therapy, the fundamentals and how to apply them in practice. And as an old, as an old uh, dog myself, when I run into other old dogs, I see that when we're talking, we all need to be reminded from time to time of all the fundamentals as well. And so I'm hoping to, uh, to create a seminar uh, series in February that is both good for, uh, for people perhaps who haven't heard a lot of these ideas or the, the sort of fundamental principles of psychotherapy, but also those of you that have been around want to refresh a course and who in a sense can, um, can join with me and help me sharing cases and talking about these issues um, to, uh, to help our younger colleagues perhaps have, have an ear to, uh, to a, you know, a group of people, kind of like a salon where they can get input and learn some, you know, uh, some new things and also learn how difficult it is for, ther uh, for therapists to, uh, to learn and to know what they're doing. I think one of the things that when I, when I started out, the, uh, the idea was, well, how do I do, how, what's the right way to do therapy? And over the years, I've learned that there are so many different ways to do therapy and that you have to remain open-minded, not only to different um, conceptualizations and ideas, but also how other people who supposedly follow the same principles that you do, how differently we all do it because we embody it and we uh, therapy is not something you can do by proxy or uh, you know without your personality and your body being involved. And so there's a large component of performance art of uh, you know of, of uh, interactive uh, discovery and um, uncertainty in the process of therapy. And I think one of the hallmarks of experience is growing more and more comfortable with imperfection and um, being able to not have an agenda but follow the client some, you know, a lot of the time and learn what's going on and use what you know to, uh, you know, to add to all of that. So in the, uh, the, the series in February, I've uh, just sort of to try to label things, I've divided into four different, uh, different sections. The first uh, part I'm going to talk about or focus on is the person of the therapist. In other words, our subjective experience, our personal experience in therapy and the uh, the challenges there and you know our internal the internal processes that lead us to want to become a therapist and then the types of challenges we have during our practice um the second sec uh second lecture will be focused on the therapist client connection so interpersonal attunement and the uh, what i could from a neurobiological perspective i call the social synapse you know connecting across the social synapse and a, a process that i call sociostasis which is how do we, through our interactions, influence the brains and bodies of those folks that we're interacting with. A lot of uh, the book that I wrote, The Neuroscience of Psychotherapy, focuses on those things of uh, how do we trigger neuroplasticity in others. And um, one of probably my most influential teacher, teachers, Carl Rogers, had a very good style and method for that. And I've incorporated in my teaching over the years some of the uh, exercises and principles that uh, he used in his seminars. Um, third focus will be creating a case conceptualization. In other words, how should we be thinking about the uh, about what our clients come in with, what they've experienced, how that's influenced their brain and mind and relationships and and spirit, and how we understand that and think about it going forward and developing a treatment plan. And then finally, I think something that is a very, uh, a very big challenge for all of us, but I think especially for, um, for uh, newer therapists, is working with resistance, understanding character defenses, and trying to, instead of being upset or afraid of resistance, or like a lot of my students have told me, I'm waiting for the resistance to go away so that I can start doing therapy with my client. And instead of having that perspective, thinking in terms of, no, the resistance is the therapy. The resistance is actually what the client brings that they need to uh, learn about in order to understand it, experience it, accept it, and then maybe transcend it to uh, to get into the, the deeper work of being open. So again, those, so those are the four general categories um, of, of focus. Some of the some of the highlights, I think, that I really um, like to share are things like um, the transcending the idea of being perfect. Kind of alluded to this, but alluded to this before. A lot of us feel like frauds when we do therapy because we feel we're supposed to know all the answers, and every session is supposed to end with an aha and a big smile. 
And um, perfection is not something that um, exists on this planet, at least not that I've seen so far. So there's an internal process that therapists, I think, all need to go through to accept who they are and allow themselves not to be crushed by um, guilt and, and self-blame for imperfection. I think um, it's much better to just assume you're going to be imperfect. And every once in a while, when something works out, you can just celebrate it. But don't expect it to happen again anytime soon or on cue. Okay. Um, another principle I love to talk about is making good mistakes. If we're all going to make mistakes, then the question is, how do we turn those mistakes into something therapeutically positive? So I think that's an important, uh, uh, an important for, uh, uh, focus as well. Okay. Um, a big focus of mine has been, uh, always has been uh, being aware of countertransference and how that manifests in the relationship and um, how it can, how because of our needs, we can steer the therapy away from what the client needs and more focus on what we need from the relationship. And um, also the other side of that is how can we use our countertransference in a positive way to help us understand both ourselves and our, ourselves and our clients. So how um, the, the sort of the, the, the delivery, the mechanisms of delivery of, uh, you know, of these seminars will be um, those reading. I'm going to be using um, two books that I've written relatively short. So don't get frightened by thinking that you have to read two books to be involved in the seminar. But one is called The Making of a Therapist, just like the seminar series. And the other is called The Development of a Therapist, which have some... Uh, more less basic and more complex applications of uh, things like neuroscience. Um, I think uh, social media addiction is an incredibly uh, widespread problem with our clients and um, you know, social media and media in general, the, the total penetration of screens has really affected the way our clients' brains process information, how they focus and attend and concentrate. And we may be having to modify not only education, but also therapy going forward, giving, given that we are getting uh, clients with brains that have lived now in somewhat of a different environment than uh, the uh, those seniors of us who grew up. Remember like uh, having blocks and dolls and playing and out in the dirt and running around with trees. Remember that? A lot of kids don't do that at all anymore, at least uh, like I said, in, in my neck of the woods. And so um, we have to be sensitive to the fact that we can't make assumptions about how the brains of younger clients are organized and what they can benefit from and what they can't benefit from. So that's going to be a, a you know a focus as well. And um, what I love to do also is I love to take standard uh, principles like psychodynamic principles or from other you know, family systems and those sorts of things, and really explain those principles from uh, from science, from a scientific perspective, right? So, for example, I've just been recently uh, talking about Freud's projective hypothesis and thinking about his his notion of, uh, and you're probably all aware of this, you know, ambiguous. When we confront ambiguous stimulus, uh, an ambiguous stimulus, our brains are prone and you know, or or pushed towards as well as our minds to make to complete things, to make understanding of it, to create narratives, to make meaning. And that push is what, um, what neuropsychologists would call the construction of awareness or the construction of consciousness based on hidden layers, implicit layers of neuroprocessing. Freud called this projection because we were trying to get things out of ourselves and put them into other people or out in the world. Um, his perspective might have some truth. I actually prefer the neuroscientific perspective of this. You don't have to choose, you know, you can you can do 60, 40, 70, 30 in, in what your beliefs are. But what I tend to do is I um, I sort of evaluate the principles from other forms of therapy that I've studied and that I've used from the perspective of neuroscience and try to and, and biology and evolution as well, and try to see, you know, what can we have the most faith in? What principles seem to hold the most weight? and which things might be more of a manifestation of temporal, cultural, you know, uh, whatever, in, in imperialistic white male distortion. How do we separate that and how do we get below that to whatever degree we're capable of in our cultures to, um, to discover perhaps another layer that's a little, that cuts a little bit closer to the bone? I don't believe we can ever get out of being embedded in our, you know, in our time and our 
culture and our space, but certainly we can push and look beyond that. And so um, one of the things I like to do, I don't really, ex I don't really accept any theory um, as a given. I try not to believe anything like a, a religious belief. What I like to do is to talk about them and really uh, understand them from multiple perspectives. And if possible, see if we can't come up with a variety of ways to explain the same principles so that when we're working with our clients, we can kind of select how we want to phrase it and how we want to discuss it based on um, what we know about the client and what they might accept. One thing I've, I've noticed over the years is that when I, um, I guess my first 10 or 15 years of practice, I would say 90% of my clients were women. And over the last 10 or 15 years now, 90% of my clients are men. And I think one of the things that's happening is that the, um, there are very few men left doing therapy where I, where I live. So it's become primarily, um, you know, a, 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 a woman's domain. Um, but I think on the other hand, it's like the focus on having scientific explanations or alternative explanations for what's going on and being able to frame treatment in different ways has allowed me to get traction with many male clients who, especially where I am, I'm surrounded by Google and, and Netflix and Facebook and YouTube and all of these different businesses. And um, keeping the engineering type, the left hemisphere bias folks in treatment is quite a challenge. They don't really comprehend the, um, you know, with women, it's relatively easy. You ask them how they feel and they tell you. When you ask a man how they feel, very often they'll tell you what they're thinking for months, right? No matter what you do to try to get them to, to focus. So it's almost like often with men, you have to teach them a language of feeling. And um, that's really interesting, but it helps to have alternative perspectives. So again, I'm not selling any particular perspective. I, no, sorry about no. that. My duck phone went off. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so it's, I don't have any, like I said, I'm not a proponent or a devotee of any particular form of therapy, but I do like to uh, put therapy under the microscope and, and really evaluate it. Okay. Um, in, in, the, in the seminars starting in, uh, you know, the ones we're having uh, early next year, there is going to be the reading, as I mentioned before, we've got the two, um, two books to, uh, to work with. Um, I'll be giving lectures, brief lectures um, on different topics. And, but I don't, I guess lecturing is my least favorite way to teach um, because I, I have a hard time attending for, to lectures for more than 10 or 15 minutes. And so what I've done in my classes, and this follows, uh, this follow, follows Roger's way of Roger's teaching, is that we engaged in, lot, you know, we read, we read his work, but we engaged in lots and lots of discussions. And we also did experiential exercises. So what we would do, and this is what I've been doing since I started teaching psychotherapy classes back in the early, um, back in the uh, mid eighties actually, is that I have a, um, I'll have someone volunteer and we'll do a brief uh, 10, 15 minute session perhaps. And then we go, we go through that session and then We'll have a small group, like, uh, you know, Matt, you can call it a salon or a small group. And I'm going to be inviting people uh, who uh, who are in part of the training in February to come, become part of that, to uh, to interact with me, maybe even volunteer to be uh, a client for a demonstration. Mm -hmm. And so after the 10 or 15 minute uh, demonstration, then what we do is open the floor and go around and everyone shares their perspective. Um, and again, it's not about how to do the right way or the wrong way to do therapy. It really is a matter of uh, feeling free. In other words, there's a, there's a process I call and I describe in the, in the making of a therapist called shuttling. And I learned this from one of my supervisors years ago, who was a Gestalt therapist. And he talked about um, his, his training. I guess he also did a lot of meditation and mindfulness work back in the, in the seventies and eighties. And he talked about how, when he's sitting across from a client, he likes to, if he's in his head, he likes to shuttle down to his body and get a sense of what he's feeling. And this goes very much into that, that whole notion of uh, uh, sociostasis. You might think about our bodies in a sense and our, and our minds and our hearts as a, a kind of radar dish for things that are coming from our client, both conscious and unconscious. And if we can, if we stop sort of uh, 
focusing specifically just on their words or on the logic of what our client is saying, there are these other levels of information. They're not necessarily verbal. They might be, they might come in the form of, of, uh, of uh, feelings in your body, cramps, pains, tightnesses. Of uh, sometimes there are there are images that emerge out of nowhere, and you're not even sure how they're relevant or if they're relevant to your client. But in the shuttling process, it's really kind of loosening from uh, a death grip on rationality and words, and becoming more and more uh, free in your consciousness to allow your awareness to go from your head down into your body, up into your head again. The other part of it is to shuttle between your perspective and an imaginary uh, and, and going in, in a sense, to, a, to the mind of your client and imagine what it would be like to be them and what you look like to them. So in a sense, it's loosening your, your conscious awareness from inside of here to float up and down and to shuttle up and down and shuttle back and forth. And so part of the assignment, um, and we're going to demonstrate one today for the for the participants in that, is really to listen and let them think in terms of what, what free associations are they having, right? What feelings does the interaction arise? And it's uh, partly what this is, is um, realizing that everyone who's listening might do the therapy in somewhat of a different way. Each person might pick up on something that they hear that someone else might not pay attention to. Um, and becoming aware of, of the flexibility and the multiplicity of perspectives and techniques that we can use. Because I really do believe that uh, together, you know, I, I think in terms of the brain as a social organ, the mind doesn't necessarily, ex we assume the mind exists in the skull, but I really think of the mind in terms of something that exists in the space between us. And I've had many experiences in my life partly sometimes playing music with, with other people and sometimes being engrossed in conversations where it becomes sort of clear to me that my mind is not in here. My mind is in a shared space between uh, myself and the other people. And when I'm, when those things are really clicking, I feel a lot smarter. I, I don't worry about being right. I think I focus on expanding and including other people's perspectives. And I think that was uh, certainly, I don't think Carl ever, uh, Carl Rogers ever sort of uh, articulated that specifically. He was a very um, conservative, quiet, quiet man. And um, his, his theories were almost deceptively simplistic. And I remember as a young academic, my first reaction to Rogers was, oh my God, like how boring. You know, there's no real, there, there's no challenge here. There's no debate. And then after being with him for a few days, I discovered myself having fantasies that he would adopt me and take me home, right? So there's something about that, um, that space of, of acceptance and positive regard that I think is an ideal therapeutic environment. I think it's a, often an ideal ther uh, environment for, for you know, romantic relationships, for friendships, for child rearing. And what I found in the research is that the types of biochemical processes and neural dynamics that get activated in those states actually enhance actually enhance neuroplasticity and learning. So Rogers was also a neuroscientist. He just didn't know it, right? We didn't have the the technology. In a similar way, Freud was, and uh, it was hard. It was uh, it, he he came up. He wrote a, a a work called the Project for Scientific Psychology in the late I think in the late eighteen. 90s or probably in the 1890s. He never published it. It wasn't published until after his death in 1953. But if you look at that, you can see that he really sort of uh, uh, foreshadows in his work the things that we're working on now. So in many ways, this is a continuation of Carl Rogers. It's a continuation of Freud. Um, family systems, given that I think the brain is a social organ, family systems is completely brought into the tent and the, and the mechanisms that we see there. Um, cognitive therapy is maybe has a less prominent spot, but there's no doubt that our thinking and our core beliefs influence our behaviors and our thoughts and our emotions. And so um, this is not an exclusive or specific focus. This really is inclusive um, as far as uh, bringing in all the languages of, you know, of the different therapy that therapies that work. One of the things that happens, I think, is that um, 
the uh, students get confused because they graduate from school and they know they don't know what they're doing yet and they haven't had the, enough supervision to really do therapy. And they usually run from training to training to training and they get all these letters after their names and they, um, they're they specialized in this, uh, you know, EMDR and trauma informed and, and you know, internal uh, family systems and, you know, God knows what else, you know, you can, you're, you're familiar with them all, you get brochures every week you know, from companies uh, selling these things. And it's not that any of them are not are not helpful or positive or good. It's that many of the students lack the fundamental understanding and the principles of psychotherapy that allow them to take those tools and put it in a box. They don't really have the box yet. And so they've got all these tools, but there's no way to think about them or organize them or put them in perspective. And so I think one of the things I see as, um, you know, as I reach the, you know, act three of my career, what I'd like to do now going forward really is to bring back, synthesize and bring back the learning I think that was so fundamental for me and help help students, help other, other theoreticians, other therapists to think about how we organize all of these different uh, tools and knowledge and ideas and theories that we have in a way that they can be used uh, most productively. So I think that's my, my little um, you know, spiel about the uh, sort of an overview and uh, so one of the things I was thinking of, Liam, if it's a, it seems like a good idea for you to bring bring our our panelists, our salon in and um, do that. Is that a good time for that? That's a good time, Lou. Yeah. All right. Great. Great. So here we are. Um, maybe each of you want to just say hi and um, tell everyone who's watching what you do and how why you're here. Why don't you start, Kira? Sure, Lou. Um... I'm an art therapist and I work with young people mostly. Um, and I guess I'm here because a lot of what you say rings true to me. So I'm really uh, curious about, about your way of teaching. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Well, welcome. Good to have you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Brendan, how about you? Just unmute myself. Um, Hi, Lou. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Brendan, Brendan McKeown. I live in Dublin. Uh, I started in this field in the area of addiction and then moved into family therapy. And then I realized I was really in my head and a journey into my body and uh, trained in a modality called somatic experiencing. And uh, I really feel, I suppose, uh, the importance of an embodied perspective and, and a neurobiological perspective. And I'm very excited by what's happening in the field of psychotherapy at the moment and uh, really are drawn to the ideas of Lou around integrating all the different perspectives and bringing them into that sort of template of interpersonal neurobiology, which I feel is the best template that I know of locating all the different perspectives. You know, So I'm very excited about doing that and doing it in the format that Lou is proposing, which is a very kind of open, discursive, kind of creative kind of format, which I really am drawn to. So looking forward to this evening and to continuing to work with uh, um, on the seminars. Yeah. Thank you, Brendan. Welcome. Yeah. Helma, how about yourself? Yeah, so I'm Helma and I work as a psychotherapist in private practice in Dublin. I work mainly with developmental trauma. And I'm here because uh, I think there's something really important and valuable about going back to basics. And um, it's really important to um, just really work on skills. And it is true that very often we have a lot of intellectual understanding and knowledge, but actually how to translate that and apply that with a client that sits in front of you is a totally different story. And I think um, this course with Lou can really provide that basis. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Helma. Welcome. Yeah. And what you said reminded me, and I don't really, I don't remember where I learned it from, but it's from very early in my life. And someone said, understanding is the booby prize, <laughs> right? You can understand everything about what's going on in your life. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to help you change or live a better life. So mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Helma. Welcome. Brenda, how about yourself? Here we go. Good evening, everybody. I am Brenda. I'm a counseling psychologist from South Africa, East London. I am in private practice and I aspire to be able to integrate neurobiology into what I do. Um, 
I'm at a stage now of practicing for 11 years, which is makes me young. <laughs> um, but also at this point, wondering what do I do with all these bits and pieces of information mm -hmm. that resonate and the things that um, I have to let go of because they really don't serve me as a therapist anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so I think listening to Lou and the rest of the panel on our introduction evening, um, it really made me very excited to hear how other people grapple and what they grapple with. Mm -hmm. Very much looking forward to this. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. Welcome. Carly, how about yourself? Hello, my name is Carly Pittman and I live in Austin, Texas, and I'm delighted to be here with you all this afternoon. It's afternoon for me. And I work with women who are recovering from eating disorders and food compulsions. And uh, yeah, I resonate with so much of what others have shared. And I think of all the different trainings I've done, and then I almost can get a headache when I'm trying to synthesize <laughs> all the different pieces and how does this fit with this and can can feel that left brain really take over um so for myself what i'm really intrigued by and is kind of deepening that trust that you talked about and certainly embracing imperfection has been a big part of my journey and bringing some levity to that process and yeah how the, all these different pieces kind of dance and fit together and in my own work, what I really, uh, I really enjoy is integrating contemplative practice and interpersonal neurobiology, because to me, they're kind of speaking and speaking to the same place. So that's kind of where I work in my, in with my people. Mm -hmm. So thank you for having me. Oh, great, Carly. Welcome. Yeah. And Robert, how about yourself? Hi, everyone. Um <clears throat> Robert O'Driscoll is my name. I work as an addiction counsellor for the addiction services in Cork and Kerry. I live in East Cork and I kind of got interested in this area over the last maybe five or six years after attending a webinar or actually it was a face-to-face -face seminar with Dan Siegel. Uh, introduction to interpersonal neurobiology maybe four or five years ago. Um, so that intrigued me. And as I entered the second half of my career, everything you've described about um, your approach to your idea of becoming a therapist, therapist, it resonated with me as part of my own journey. So I'm really looking forward to the um, session tonight and the, the, the webinar series. Well, welcome, Robert. Thanks for being here. Yeah, I just a feeling that I have in listening to to we oh, Liam, why you would you like to go as well? I'm sorry. I was thinking of you as my boss as opposed to one of the participants. <laughs> no, no, I I just say I'm I'm delighted to be here tonight and I'm delighted to um this feels very exciting, this new format and um like just to say a little bit how I got in contact with you, Lou, is that like a lot of people that we've had over the last few years, they would always re reference Dr. Lou Casalino. So I often kind of wondered who, who this guy is. Um, and then a good mutual friend of ours, Marshall, I was speaking to Marshall one day and we were talking about kind of loving our clients and, you know, opening our hearts to clients. And Marsha said to me, well, you have to meet Dr. Lou Casalino because he loves all his clients. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, I, I, I really must meet Lou. Um, so it, it's, it's been a pleasure, Lou. And, you know, I really look forward to the webinar series in February because, um, you know, you're, you're somebody that, that I really, you know, enjoyed working with. And you're somebody that, you know, that, that, that's easy to work with. Um, and that's, you know, and we have different experiences with different presenters. So, you know, you just really have um, a great personality to put people at ease. And um, so I thank you for that. And I really look forward to February. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, great. Thank you, Leah. Yeah, it's like, I want to share too that in listening to all of you share your stories, it makes me feel a little less alone in the world. So I appreciate that. It's, um, it's even though we have colleagues and we talk to people, um, you know, from uh, on a regular basis, say, it's, um, there's something so wonderful about knowing that other people are on their version of your journey. And that, um, you know, we're, we're in this together. And, uh, you know, so thank you, Liam, and, and you and, and the organization for allowing the platform for all of us uh, to be together. One of the things that I've gotten from supervision groups I was, I've been in before, especially a group I was in where I think I was the youngest person, so I was the junior, surrounded by all of these really experienced therapists. And I was always, I would always come in kind of like, you know, like with a with a case that I would present, it's like, oh, I can't, I don't know if I'm doing it right. I don't know if I'm missing through well. And they were, you know, there were these uh these I would they, to me, they were like old folks. They're probably my age now, but back then they were like these old fogies, you know, with white hair. And um they would always say, You're doing a great job. What are you worried about? You know, relax. You're giving your clients a lot just by how much you care for them. Sure, we can work out some tweaks, we can always improve. But take it easy. You know, you shouldn't feel exhausted at the end of a session. If you are, you're not doing it right. Maybe it's like hitting a golf ball. If you're if you're in pain when you're doing it, you, your form probably isn't correct. And their advice to me was more was just be yourself, be a human being. Um, and one told me a great story. They said, you know, at the beginning when we're doing therapy, sometimes we pay attention to every word because we're afraid we're going to miss something important. And one of the... Uh, one of the these senior therapists said, think of think of the important things kind of like a train under the Christmas tree, right? It goes by. If it goes by and you miss it, don't worry. It's not far away. It'll come back, right? And as I thought, you know, the more I've uh, studied, uh, Wilhelm Reich has had a big influence on me and the embodiment of character in our musculature and in our um, character logical defenses. It's it's so comforting to me to know, yeah, the, the important things come back. So if you relax and if you're in your body and you're in your heart, um, you're going to pick up on those things. You may not get it the first couple of times around, but the train will be back. OK, and then you can sort of get more and more evidence for it in different contexts. And when you do finally make an interpretation, if you choose to, then you can use that. Um, you can use all the evidence that you've accomplished, but don't be in a hurry. You don't have to say the perfect thing the first time or right away. It's a it's a um, it's an ongoing relationship, and clients actually appreciate it when you don't jump to to being right or having brilliant thoughts or whatever. Take your time, let them let them relax, get to know them, and when you do make an interpretation or bring up something that is an attempt to add to the uh, to what they're thinking about or to give them a new perspective. Um, Posit it very hypothetically, almost like they, I don't know if you guys are familiar in different countries. We used to have this detective on TV in the States called Columbo. Did that make it to other parts of the world too? Um, and so Columbo was disheveled and his hair was messed up. He drove an old Peugeot that hardly ran. The car was falling apart. He was lucky he got anywhere with it. And he was always confused. And Peter Falk, his eyes were pointing in different, he looked like he was completely you know, out of it. But he was brilliant, right? And so um, years ago, I thought about, you know, being a Columbo when it comes to adding things to the relationship or adding interpretations or new information, because it, it, it Columbo had the, had the ability to get people to relax because they weren't afraid of him because he seemed so bumbling, right? And yet when he would add these things, the defenses would be lowered so they would be able to get in more easily, right? And I know that um, this is a, a problem with some therapists is that they really feel, they really need to see themselves as being smart and, and like the Oracle of Delphi and coming, you know, coming to the earth and, and giving proclamations. And there's nothing that will activate defenses, like being an oracle of Delphi, right? It's much better for you to be Columbo. And it's a lot easier too, because when you present things that way, if someone doesn't, you know, if someone doesn't uh, accept them, and often even if we're correct, 
Our clients don't accept things, right? We haven't invested that much in it. We can let it go. But if it's real, it's like a train under the Christmas tree and it comes back again and again, right? And so we can relax and not push our agenda and let the client uh, clients lead us. Okay. Um, if uh, uh, anyone have anything they'd like to add or any thoughts about what I talked about before or what all of us have been saying, just open the floor for a moment for input. No, we're all good. Okay, I don't see anybody's mutes going off, so I'm assuming you're all you're all with me. All right. Well, at this point, what I'd like to do is to do um, a demonstration of the experiential exercise that uh, I like to include in in the trainings and therapy. And, um, and Kira has volunteered, and uh, just as full disclosure, uh, we did something. We we had a meeting um, earlier in the week, so we had a ten or fifteen minute uh, session then. And um, so if you don't be, don't be amazed at how much I know just from the air, uh, that's not what's happening here. We've already had a session. Um, like I said, our, I think it was about uh, 15 minutes or so. And um, we're gonna pick up on that, but for all of you, for the people who are, you know, the, our, our salon here, and also for all of you listening, what I'd like you to do is to think back to that. Um, the thing I talked before about shuttling, right? Is to see if you can't, uh, loosen your consciousness up a bit from inside of your skull and let it float down into your body. And as you're listening, float into, if you want to float into my head and my body or Kira's head and body, whatever, just use your um, imagination to see what this would feel like from different perspectives. Be thinking in terms of um, what, how you would react. Imagine if you were uh, my client, how would you react to the things I'm saying? Or if you were me, the therapist, what would you say that I haven't said, or what did I say that you would never say in a million years? Whatever it is, right? Just allow yourself to be loose. Let your let your consciousness float and be loose, and um, be open to whatever emerges. Right? Okay. So I guess we can start now. So Kira, we, Kira and I had a like I said, we had a session on Monday for fifteen minutes. So we want to. Um, Instead of giving any kind of preview to that, what I'm going to do is ask her just to, you know, to uh, say what she remembers from from that brief interaction and what she'd like to continue talking about today, if anything. Thanks, Lou. Um, first of all, I must apologize. I'm a little croaky. I've picked up a cold. I might cough a little, but hopefully it won't be too disruptive. Um, so, Lou, on Monday, um, what I noticed in, you know, just before coming on to do the demo with you was that my younger part that often feels not enough was very present. Mm -hmm. And she's here again tonight. Mm -hmm. And you also mentioned earlier that notion of feeling like a fraud, which would feel very familiar to me. And so it's something that I would like to explore with you here this evening. Mm -hmm. Continue that exploration. Sure. Wonderful. Would you, um, might it be helpful or it might be helpful to me, but would it be good for you to, um, to talk about that younger self, to, to share more about her so I can get to know her better? Sure. Um, I guess this, this younger self, um, um, has this feeling of never being enough, never, never, you know, matching up to what I need to be. Mm -hmm. So it's familiar to me for as long as I can remember. And um, I think perhaps, you know, being the youngest of seven, um, even though there were seven siblings, I still have this feeling of being very alone. Mm -hmm. Somehow this, this younger part mm -hmm. felt very alone. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me more about that, about that feeling, about what in your body, in your heart, what that being alone feels like? Yeah, it feels pretty, um, there's huge sadness with it. 
mm-hmm. um, like a heavy heart. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, um, yeah, it makes me really wonder about, you know, what I have missed out on because of this somehow not being able to connect. Yeah. Can, you think about, can you think about a situation in your life where you're, you're aware that you missed out on something? Um, yeah, I guess, you know, I would wonder about my, my role as a parent mm-hmm. and how that may have been impacted by, you know, my that that feeling in me of never, never being enough. Mm-hmm. You know, it would have been very present in my role as a parent, you know, having guilt around, you know, maybe just not matching up. Yeah. What did, what did your what did your children need that you didn't that you weren't able to give them? Um I would say my true presence. True present. Okay. Yeah. My true presence. I think um, so much of that was really um, impacted by that that feeling of not being enough, that feeling like a fraud. Mm-hmm. So yeah. almost being embarrassed about being found out. Yes. As, a, as not a, a good parent. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, very much so, that fear of, you know, yeah, being found out. Right. But another related question, what what didn't you get from your parents that you needed? I guess they were both very wounded. Um, and would have had a lot of anxiety and insecurity. And I think that they were probably not able to be truly present with me, Mm -hmm. which is possibly why I felt a difficulty in connecting with them. Mm -hmm. Was that also true for your relationships with your siblings? Yeah, I think so. I mean... I think if they were to hear me say it, they would be surprised. But mm-hmm. I think my experience was that that I felt quite alone a lot of the time. And I know that I had a brother older than me and he was treated very harshly by my dad, but I wasn't. I had a very different relationship with them. And mm-hmm. so somehow I felt responsible because the narrative was oh I was always very good Mm -hmm. and it was almost like I showed him up for you know for whatever whatever you know he used to do that used to touch the wounds of my dad did you feel like your other siblings resented you for being treated so well um I'd say I'd say they might have, yeah. You know, mm. I had that role of being the youngest, the baby the notion that I was always so good. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So I think I think they may have. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder. I wonder what. Can I say? I wonder what is really going on <laughs> you know I, I, it's, it's, I think because I hear I hear what you're saying and I under, you know, certainly understand that um, your words and feeling kind of estranged or like there's a some sort of a wall or a buffer yeah between you I, I wonder if um, you know can you get a sense of like what was missing like like between you and I right now yes right what's what's between us 
that you can see that we would be part of your not, you know, being truly present with me? Um, what's getting in the way of me being truly present with you? Yeah, yeah I'm just yeah. wondering, just if we get, if, if, if this is something that is kind of the way you your mind and your brain have been organized in, yes. in how you interact with the world. I'm just curious if in our relationship, just in this brief time, and yeah. even over the screen, if you can feel something that you're, sometimes I feel like, like, um, some of my clients, they're not, they're not in the same room with me. They're actually behind a one-way mirror in the next room and they send in their body or their chest piece. You know, they have a client personality they send in to interact with me, but they really don't feel that safe to come in the room. So they're sitting behind that mirror, pressing buttons and, you know, turning dials and things. So I'm just curious if there's, if you have an awareness of anything like that. Yeah, I, I guess, I suppose, um, I would, I guess, feel quite anxious about letting you see the real me, mm -hmm. somehow. Mm -hmm. So I would say I would um, not feel comfortable enough to go there yet. Right, right. And, and what, it, don't go there. But could you tell me, like, what would I see if you did go there? What what would Kira look like? Would she be like a raving lunatic? Would she be dancing around? Like, you know, would she be doing river dance? What would what would it look like if I was watching, you know, watching no. your screen being your real self? I know, you know, I'm not even sure what I'm so afraid of, you know? Uh, I'm really not sure. Mm. But I seem to have this notion that. You know, mm -hmm. if you really saw me, you would not accept me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we're not clear what it would be that I would really see. No, we're okay. not clear about that. No, mm -hmm. we're not. I'd love to know. It sounds like you would love to know, too. I'd love to know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll find out in February. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you know, just what uh, a uh, a thought that comes to mind is. I just had a picture. I had a picture of you um, and come to mind as a little girl, and in the situation that you're in, where you had to be the good one, the happy one, or whatever, the one that did no wrong. Yeah, and you know, and in a sense, being aware that you had to play that part. You know, like here I am, the happy little girl. You know, don't I look cute? Yes, and, uh, but then having also to, to sort of partition or separate the part of you that say play when you when you felt angry yeah. or, or frightened or or angry at your dad for treating your brother so badly like what the hell is wrong with you he's your yeah. son you yeah know? yeah but didn't really match the cute little girl no there so you no room for that no right. room for that and so yeah. that you needed in a sense to sort of I love Alice Miller had a had a, a term in her work, the drama of the gifted child. She mm -hmm. talked about she talked about double amnesia. She said that you've got you find those parts of yourself that can't be tolerated and you have to forget about them. Right. Wow. And then you have to forget you've forgotten. That's yeah. the that's the double amnesia. So there's this layer that you have a vague sense something is there, but you can't even think about what it might be, let alone where you could find it. Yes. Yeah. That resonates. Yeah. One, one of my clients who who told me uh, uh, years ago a similar story, she said, as a girl, she imagined that she took all of those feelings that nobody could accept in her. And she opened, I guess she must have seen some sort of a movie where they hid stuff under the floor. Yeah. So she imagined that there was a little, there was a, she lifted up this floorboard. She put all of those feelings down there. And then she put the floor back and she put a rug over it. Wow. Right. And right. she said that for years, she just had this vague intuition that something was there, but she had forgotten what was there and she had forgotten where she hid it. Oh. Right. right. I don't know if that resonates at all, but that is, uh, you know, I've heard. And I yeah. think I felt, I felt similar things myself. Hmm. That's good to hear. Yeah. 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 
So I think sort of thinking in terms of if this if this was a an ongoing therapy relationship, yes. one of the things that I, you know we probably I'd like to say possibly let's pick a metaphor, and the metaphor might be the floorboard or whatever it is that you know fits your your yeah. path your imagination, and then think in terms of how do we find it? How do we how do we knock on the floor on the walls? How do we figure out where these things are hidden? Yes. And what is it that even though you're not aware of it? still haunts you and makes you feel inadequate or that you have to be that things that are unintegrated into you that you need to bring in. And, um, you know, you probably need to be more ornery or expressive or angry or God knows what, whatever wasn't acceptable. Yeah. Kid, those things that have been pushed away probably need to be reintegrated. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Certainly anger would be one emotion that I need to work on. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And anger, just to, you know, to, to, to sort of say uh, some of the thinking about anger, because I think this is a problem a lot of people share, is that when we're kids, we get the message to not be angry. You know, yes. like we're not, it's like we should, children shouldn't have those emotions or whatever. And what happens then is if you bottle those up, you you don't even express anger you express rage you get out of control and you scream and shout and you, you have a tantrum right yeah. but i th i think that in, is that we conflate rage and anger like rage is a is a right hemisphere emotion that comes from feeling trapped or cornered or out of control right yeah anger is emotion that evolved as a left hemisphere emotion that evolved along with attachment Mm. not only do we have to feed our children and nurture them, but we have to protect them from predators, mm. you know, from dangers. Yeah. And so I, it's kind of like baby in the bathwater. A lot of, a lot of us throw away our anger because we're ashamed of our rage. Wow. Right. But the problem yeah. is our anger is attached to our, our boundaries, our assertiveness. Right. Yes. And, and, you know, and our power. Yeah. And so we want to get our anger back, separate it from rage, get our anger back, and then discover the boundaries and the power. Mm -hmm. you know, so mm -hmm. many people with somatic, psychosomatic disorders, you know, the best treatment often is assertiveness training wow. because they need to be able to get those feelings out of their body and out into the world so that then it doesn't manifest as physical symptoms. Great. Yeah. So just something to something to think about. Yeah. For sure. Thanks, Lou. Thank you. Well, Kira, thank you so much for volunteering. I really, uh, really appreciate it. And, and sort of, uh, you know, navigating uh, congestion, which is <laughs> a challenge when you're trying to talk online. So thank you very much. Thanks, Lou. Appreciate yeah, it. I'm going to open the floor now. And I just want to hear from, uh, from the folks, uh, you know, in our group, just to go around and say, you know, what did you see? What were you thinking? And again, don't focus so much on diagnosing or, you know, or curing uh, Kira in this moment. We've got plenty of time to do that with her over the, over the years. <laughs> but um, what, what I'd like you to do really is think more like focusing on yourself, what you felt, what you saw, um, what you might have liked to do, what I did that you don't agree with at all, whatever it is. Uh, Liam, would you care to start? I will for sure, Lou. Um, just to read a comment first from Tracy. Tracy says, please, can I transplant Lou's brain into my head? Well, if you have the technology, we can give it a try. <laughs> if, you're, if you're much younger than I am, I'll take you up on that because it'll give me a longer runway. <laughs> Yeah, I, I really enjoyed watching it, Lou. My my own experience at the start, I in my body I noticed a lot of tension, mm -hmm. especially around the back of my neck and just around this area. And it was initially and I really kind of enjoyed the, the little explorations that you did with Kara. Especially around, you know, asking her um, to tell you a bit more about her, the little girl part and, mm -hmm. you know, just the family explorations. And really, really at the end, what I noticed that the, oh, a lot of the, all the tension really just went out of my body. Mm -hmm. And and as well, I I had 
just uh, particularly around the top of my top lip, just a real kind of numbness and a mm. real kind of intensity in it, which was kind of quite interesting as well. Um, but I, I, I just... I, I just loved the way it, the way it kind of it flowed and and it there was a part then where I kind of Jesus I said you know he's 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 actually doing he's very challenging now I think there was about seven or eight minutes in around I forget the exact context but it was something around um what are you keeping out or you know. So I was kind of a bit thrown by that, but it, it was you know it was it was it it felt like it was very compassionate. Um, so this just overall, there seemed to be a lot happening. You know, there was a lot happening in a very short time. Mm -hmm. So I I think that's all I'd say, Lou. That's that was mm -hmm. my kind of experience. Yeah, very interesting. You're being aware of different of what's going on in your body. It'd be so if we had the time to just sort of come on in now you do it let, let's explore what you know what is your body telling you what's getting manifest in your body that's yeah, well, really I think, I think one of it well I actually that was one of the things well one of the things I, I could relate to Karen in a way um that's one of the thoughts I had that when I'm in therapy I feel one of the things I protect myself against is is my rage mm -hmm. grief and vulnerability. So a lot of, a lot of, you know, my tension can be around that. You know, not not letting you see how kind of how much rage I have, or not mm -hmm. letting you see how much grief I have, or you know how much kind of vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Because actually, when at the end, when when the tension went, it kind of nearly very deep inside myself. I could kind of feel a little kind of shaking, mm -hmm. a kind of trembling. Um, so yeah, it was very interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it seems like you had, and this was what my hope was, if you pay attention to yourself, you're having a whole therapy session while you're watching a therapy session, Yeah. right? Which I think is a, it's a beautiful thing, especially if, if you haven't experienced it before for younger clinicians. And they go, holy crap, like there's a whole other backstory like I'm in therapy making believe that the client is the only person in the world right and then there's this whole backstory going on that is influencing and shaping and you know and going on uh that might be influencing the therapy it may not be but it's like it's a it's another uh whole it's a, it's under that floorboard you know finding that part of you the the, the, yeah. the part that's going on in the background yeah thank you Liam. that's yeah, great and, and just the, the last piece even kind of after sharing that then I can kind of feel a little kind of spaciness coming in mm -hmm. which is interesting um but yeah thanks Lou yeah you're welcome yeah I know our brains are always working really hard to keep us from going places where we feel anxious and mm -hmm. that can manifest as um my thing is if I'm if I'm getting too challenged I get hungry so I got to get up and go do go eat something Right. So food for me has been a way to avoid feelings and that, you know, coming from an Italian family, I came by it. Honestly, that's what we all did. We didn't express our emotions. We just got fatter and fatter. <laughs> <laughs> Brendan, how about you? Would you like to share anything? Yeah, absolutely, Lou. I really, I really found it very helpful. It, it's like I'm still processing it in some way. It's still still it's distilling in a way, uh, but very much. Uh, the protector came out of me again you know i i felt uh it was like i was i was sitting in in Keir's little box and keeping you kind of you know uh at a distance kind of stuff you know uh i really was kind of warmed by Keir's openness and vulnerability and uh I it helped me to feel safe, you know, and it was it was this whole thing about safety and threat and safety and threat, you know, um, mm. and I felt that changed a little bit during the session um, when you brought in the humor, you know, and I saw both of you sort of laughing together and that allowed me to kind of mm. come back into myself a little bit. Uh, and uh, but I was I was kind of feeling then when Kira started talking about, you know, um, 
feeling like she was missing out on something and you kind of expanded that into the kind of the two parts you know the kind of the parts of her the, the part that's acceptable you know the kind of the little girl piece and then the anger and the rage you know I, I you know I, I'm always feeling with Kira there was a part of her that wanted to be there and there's a part of her that didn't want to be there you know and it was like I think that's what I was trying to protect in some way I was feeling there was a part of Kira didn't want to be there and I wanted to kind of protect the part of her that didn't want to be there in some way you know so, uh, that's about uh, but I really enjoyed it and, and I, I really I, I suppose um, uh, you know because I have sort of moved so much into kind of uh, an embodied piece uh, it was again when the questions were quite conceptual or intellectual I kind of uh, grated a bit from that but then it was like I was really intrigued by the questions and I could see how the questions were really helping the process. And then I became really, really curious, you know, as the, as the process went on. So there was mm -hmm. a lot going on, Lou. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's good. That's yeah. good. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it's, a, it's an interesting, uh, just a, a part of my development was I used to feel with a client that, um, you know, I would be very hypersensitive to, yeah. feeling like, well, I didn't want to make them uncomfortable or tre tread on things that might be yeah. sensitive or hurt their feelings. Yeah. And so I found myself always, you know, kind of like being on, in a museum with the, with the red ropes and, and working my way around things. And because, you know, yeah. you're not able yeah. to go there. Yeah. And there was something, something changed over the years where I felt like if I go, if I go, if I climb over the ropes, and I'm there as someone who's really there to nurture instead of damage what it is that that's yeah. being protected. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It yeah. helped me, in a sense, to go in. And of course, I think you're going to like uh, press buttons or send off alarms in your client. So there's that combination of not being afraid to go there, but then also making sure that there's care and there's loving. And there's also, I think, the self just. Uh, personal disclosure sometimes it's helpful because yeah. it isn't like I'm looking at you through the microscope and I want you to yeah. bear your soul yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. like you know we're two people trying to make it through the day and figure out our lives and we both have the same handicaps yeah. right yeah. and I, yeah. I have an advantage over you because I'm not you I have a different experience and you know set of defenses and you have an advantage over me because I mean my assumption is that Kira could tell me about myself because she has the gift of not being me yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. so that is my attitude. Sometimes yeah. I don't express yeah. it in words. I'll just sort of assume it and hope that the person picks it up emotionally. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it really, really interesting because you know I always have this worry that if I go too intellectual, I go into my left hemisphere, you know, and right. you know this idea of sort of right hemisphere to right hemisphere, you know. Right. Uh, but what I hear you saying is that it's actually about your attitude. If you're coming from your heart, if you're coming from that place, you can allow yourself to trust your intuition and, tr and trust your curiosity because you're coming from that place, and that's that's by definition right hemisphere anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I think one of my one of my therapists uh, long ago, one of my supervisors said um, the the ideal place is to be. And we're thinking about left and right hemisphere. Yeah. Is that you have to be thinking with feelings. Yeah, yeah. And you yeah. have to feel with ideas. Yeah. Right. Okay. Really, yeah. If you want to, if you want to get your clients to to really get at a higher level of integration, uh -huh. you uh -huh. can't separate uh -huh. those two things. You kind of have to. It's not a vanilla or a chocolate cake. It's like a yeah. marble swirl. Yeah. Those things yeah. go together, and that's what you have to move with. So, just yeah. different ways of thinking about it. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Helma, would you like to share um, something? Yes. Um, so what, what actually stood out for me was um, that you really brought it into the present moment. Uh, she talked about her difficulties connecting and um, straight away I thought, well, we're probably going to see this, that that actually gets brought in into the relationship between you and her. And um, it was just at the time when I thought um, I'd actually now really start to get curious around what her connection is right now with you and then you asked that question and it was actually really um it was a very direct question um around you know um uh what was actually getting in, in in the way at the moment for her to be truly present with you and um so so that moved it into a very relational dynamic between you and her um but then it also um 
it got processed by actually this this kind of meta level conversation around um you know just kind of for her allowing her to step back a little bit and um looking at it from the observer point a bit so what would we see if she was in that place so mm -hmm. that's kind of just an extra buffer that i thought was very helpful um in in going near the topic but not too near mm -hmm. and um um then it was also um talking about her relationship to the issue and so again that kind of just provided that um that little bit of buffer or distance that that helps us to to go near something that actually might be just too big at the moment um you also uh, i felt there was a lot of normalizing so kind of you know putting her at ease by kind of just saying this is you know this is normal people do feel that way this will come up um and so this piece of psychoeducation was also very helpful and um i was not surprised that you know um we started out with feelings of sadness and a heavy heart and somewhere underneath we found the anger and so um i think that was just the the the, the level below it and right. so um it was good that that actually also got named and you know um i'm, I'm sure in in, in f uh, future sessions that would actually then um, become more a topic of conversation great yeah thank you hello that was great i'm just i'm reflecting as i was listening to the talk like how beneficial this would have been for me to be a fly on the wall of this conversation when I was beginning my training, you know, or maybe 10 years into my training, because I'm sharing, I'm doing my thing, I'm sharing my perspective, but every one of you are bringing up really wonderful, insightful points about this that, you know, students could learn from. So thank you, you know, thank you all. Yeah. Brenda, how about you? Would you like to share something? Yeah. I, what, what stood out for me was the ebb and flow of the conversation. Um, and it, uh, the, <laughs> I noticed that it made me feel very anxious. Like um, I got to a point where I thought, Kiara's going to run out of answers or she's going to have a coughing fit. That the thoughts came up. <laughs> and I was thinking maybe it's because I don't want it to stop. But I'm also sensing that it was going deeper, and I guess felt a bit of my own vulnerability in in Kiara's answers. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could, you could imagine having been having been of having volunteered yourself for this, and how would yeah. you have responded to the types yeah. of questions that I'm asking? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Got it. Mm -hmm. Um. um very comfortable that I did not volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> uh. <laughs> but um, I was sort of um, struck by your question when you, very, for me, um, went very quickly to what did your children need that you did not give them? Mm -hmm. I was sort of, wow, I don't even, I had to sort of backtrack in my mind as to what did you link to get to that question? And I think a moment later, it was about the not good enough. Um, I don't know if I would have gotten there. Mm -hmm. Gone maybe to the parents and the siblings. Right. Um, yeah. yeah. I, I, that, that was, I, I mean, I'm with you, Brenda. I think in my mind, the question I really wanted to ask was about her parents. But sometimes I find that if you, if you, and that's very close, but sometimes if you ask about what you didn't give, it's a really good setup because, you know, uh, parents can perceive the things that they weren't able to provide and they usually blame themselves for that. But then when they look at what they got, it reframes their guilt about being bad parents in a historical, like a multi-generational context. And what I find with many clients, it's almost like they go from thinking about this, about their bad parenting to like whoosh, you know, it's like now we've gone from one generation to almost like, you know, uh, like, um, like deep history and future. So again, I don't know if I'm right about that. It's just a, uh, it's sort of a something that I think and might have some value sometimes. Yeah. 
And and the humor. I mean, um, I did. It, there was a sense of relief when that came in. Mm -hmm. Is it purposeful, or am I being very pedantic? No. I I think you know. I don't think that I make a conscious decision to do it, but it, I would suspect that it has something to do with my own internal sense of balance, like like keeping keeping things at a level that's somewhat safe and open and not too threatening. And so I think it just comes naturally for me. Um, and sort of this zooming in and out, like the intensity and the focus, then stepping out from a distance and looking at it. And then so maybe during the course of a session, there'll be like an ebb and flow of intensity, um, okay. three or four cycles of that in, in, you know, in an hour. I don't know. I'm just guessing at that. But um, I'm aware that that process takes place. Do you... Um, do you use humor? I was trained never to use humor in sessions because that's just your counter-transference. And absolutely, sometimes it is my counter-transference, but I've used it positively so many times that, again, it, to me, it's another tool that I try to figure out how to, how to weave in when it feels appropriate. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Brenda. Yeah. Carly, would you like to share anything? Yes. Um, first of all, thank you, Kira, uh, for volunteering and doing that. Again, I'm just struck by your bravery and your vulnerability and openness to do this, not just in front of our group, but from you know, 200 people. And for you, for your your vulnerability, Dr. Liu, to do therapy in front, uh, do a session in front of all of us. Mm um what struck me about it was i noticed how my body went in and out of places of more openness and more contraction and more openness and more contraction as i was listening and there were ways that it's almost like you were a temperature regulator um that ebb and flow that you were talking about i felt that in my body and i could feel when things would kind of go a little bit forward and then kind of pull back and kind of go forward and pull back and so sometimes when it felt like it went at least for for me how I would do it if I was with someone maybe ways that you went a few steps forward that I would have only maybe gone one step forward like what Brenda talked about that question about um asking about what even asking about as as a parent or some of those places I could feel some of my body tense up a little like ah <laughs> and then other places um relax more and in my own work, I use a lot of stories. And I was struck by your use of the, the story, that image of the client that you shared and what was buried underneath the, the floorboards and the carpet. I could feel that image um, speaking to me. And it sounded like here when he would share stories and images that those were things that resonated. And sometimes I find it helpful to, it's like one step removed because it almost takes you a little breather off mm -hmm. the focus on your own experience or what's coming up in your own nervous system. And it's like together you're side by side, mm -hmm. um, taking in the experience of another that can kind of create a little bit, a deep in that sense of safety to then go back into, mm -hmm. um, you go back into her, your own experience of what you're feeling in the moment. So those are some of the things that I noticed uh, that modulate. It was like a titrating. And I don't know if that's intentional on your part of kind of going in and going out and going in a little bit and going out, but I could feel that kind of rhythm. Right. I think it's just sort of, it's a natural, I think now that feels natural. I don't think about it anymore. I, I used to have to say, okay, I've gone you know, uh oh, I, that was risky. I'll go back. I don't, and it doesn't mean I don't make mistakes and go too far. It depends on the client and depends on the situation. But I think you're picking up on that kind of natural sort of, you know, expansion and contraction and right. and the modulation. And I, I especially like, I think, to use stories, not long stories. I don't think that's helpful. But I think short stories that have a powerful image because yes. this, the image... Um, the visual image, I think, allows us to then go deeper and have a shorthand for communication. Because what I try to do with clients as I as I work with them is I try to um, I, I'm not really talking to the adult. I'm talking to the child. 
So I want to use simple language and basic pictures that get the intellectual stuff out of the way so that right. we, can, we can really connect on, on basic emotional, um, at a basic emotional level. So I try to keep my vocabulary. Um, I try to remember, I don't always do it because I love, you know, complex ideas, but I, I try to think of like, what's a third or fourth grade vocabulary? And can mm. I keep that as much as possible so that I don't trigger intellectual defenses that might get in the way? Yeah. And or intellectually defended someone is, um, you have to, you, you know, and it, that's like wrestling them down. Like you're trying to, they're going to go up and you're going to try to keep bringing them down. And, um, but not everybody goes down easily. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's what struck me about the story. It was the image. Right. It was that image that you shared. And at the end, when you said if we could create an image, um, for Kira, what she was experiencing. And yes, those images are so powerful. Um, and they do speak at the, uh, they, they speak at a different kind of level than that cognitive understanding or even that psychoeducational level where you're getting kind of a map or getting oriented or to how things can go. The images just speak and they awaken something in the body. And then they can start to speak more strongly and reveal more and more over time. Yeah, and I think too, like it, with that image, um, to go back to that between sessions or in subsequent sessions okay. where there's this sense, God damn it, where's that rug? Where is this thing? Yes. Get to the point where you're going to like grab the floorboard and pull it up. And it really is like grabbing your chest mm. at the same time. And you know, like, where the hell am I? What did I bury? What did I have to dissociate in order to survive? And how do I reclaim it? Because I could feel that rug in my um, it was so, it was like doing therapy side by side with you, Kira, where I could feel like, ooh, there's that rug. Yep, those are those floorboards. That's right. what's underneath. Um, that's what had to go underneath. And in my body at the end, after you did that image, I felt like this ripple of energy up my spine from my kind of my tailbone, just like, and I kind of shuddered a little bit because it did feel like something got cracked open a little bit and, and opened. So who knows what might show up under those floorboards? <laughs> yeah, and I think, and the images are more powerful if they're there because I I can't imagine that any of us don't have our own version of that right of what we're describing. And I remember Robert Bly, the poet, he talked about mm -hmm. the fact that um, you know we're born, we come into we come into the world, and we're full of all of this primitive energy, and we want to like you know we want all of the people for ourselves and all the food, and we want to kill all the people we don't like. And what our parents want is a good girl or boy, right? Mm -hmm. So there's that there's that that interface of those two, you know, the inside out demand and the outside in expectation. And so I think all of us have the, our version of the floorboard. Right. You know, for me, my image as a kid was my grandmother was a, was a pack rat and she collected mm. shoes by the thousands. And at the bottom of her closet was all of these shoes. And I had a fantasy that if I could get through all of those boxes, it'd be a little trap door. And if I could go in that trap door, there'd be a stairway going up to a medieval attic like Paracelsus's laboratory. And there was a, a telescope and a skull and a bunch of old dusty books with folklore in it. And that's where I would retreat to because I grew up in a family where no one was allowed to think about everything, anything. It was like if you thought it meant you weren't a good Catholic because Catholics just listen to what the church says and you don't think. Right. And so I knew that that was a bad fit for me. You know, so by by about six, six or seven, I realized, oh, I've got to create a private world for myself because I I, I can't live without thinking. I right. And so I had my my secret place, but I didn't hide that. I sort of went up there with it and it wasn't dissociated. It was just like a separate part of me that I couldn't share until I got to a certain place in education where I found other people who, right. didn't, listen, who didn't listen to the Pope. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking of that story. And if you've ever heard the story of the Linworm by um, it was a beautiful telling Martin Shaw, storyteller from England does where he talks about um, how each of us when we're born there's a there's a sibling that's born right before us that's thrown out into the wild mm. um, and then later in the story that part comes back and that's the it's like we have this part of us that is the part that 
you know, that fits in with the tribe and that belongs, but then we have to reclaim this other part that has kind of been thrown out at birth, our wild twin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Last but not least, again, go for it. <laughs> Thanks, Lou. Um, yeah. I kind of noticed your um, link to the session that we did on Monday and the way you just kind of allowed Kira to decide which direction to go in from there. That was nice and gentle. And um, I think I, I kind of noticed I, I, a kind of sense of um, Kira's courage to come online and kind of talk about her experience of kind of growing up at home and being one of seven and that resonated with my own kind of experience of family life as well so um that was nice and you, you did it with a kind of gentle curiosity and that that kind of um caught my attention mm -hmm. I, I know I, I kind of felt like a group therapy session and it was a group member if you like <laughs> Um, and I was trying to follow it, but something that happens to me in, in group and happened in, in this session was as you kind of went towards the metaphor of looking at what was under the floorboards and, and, and I just noticed that my own presence, I was distracted by, I think there was a question or a chat came in or something and, and I was just distracted and I, I, I kind of asked myself, what was that about? And and I was just aware of my own vulnerability of kind of exploring that what Bonnie Badenoch calls the implicit seller and the things that we've packed away down there. And um, and I just kind of connected with my own vulnerability around that as you began to kind of use that metaphor with, with care about uh, maybe I think you kind of put it like if we were in a longer therapy process, we might go knocking at the walls and knocking on the floorboards and seeing what echoes or whatever way you put it. Um, so that kind of, um, I noticed myself losing presence. And then when I checked back in what it was about, it was just their own vulnerability as you explore that. And also what came to mind was the importance of having good people around you, um, apart from a good therapist like yourself, good people that you can share those kind of, experiences whatever they might be um to help resolve those developmental traumas or attachment disruptions or whatever it might be that we've experienced um so that was kind of coming to mind as you went close to that um so yeah that's kind of i know a lot of what the others have said kind of resonated with me as well but that's what's come coming to mind now Lou. so thanks for allowing us to bear witness to it and the last point is that I was struck with, and I forget where who said this before, but it just was ringing in my ears as you finished up that there's no one way to do this. And it's about kind of finding our own way of doing this. Um, so that kind of rung true as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah. thanks for that. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah. I mean, it would be fun too to, uh, if you know, in a group like this, to take turns doing, and then all of us taking, because uh, again, I, I'm learning from what you're saying, and I'm sure that I would learn from you as I was watching you do what you do, because we all have slightly different ways of ways of working. Um, and just to pick up on, on something you said, Robert, is that you felt like it was like a group therapy watching an individual side. But I think that I guess one of the points I want to make is that's what's happening for all of us when we're in sessions. Simultaneously, there's this other track going where like I, so many times I've, I've had the thought, you know, like I'll, I'll suggest something to my clients and there'll be a little voice in my head that goes, God, if only you had the courage to do what you're suggesting that they do, right? Or, or like, you know, kind of like the sarcastic uncle in my head that says, you know what, what you go, oh, Mr. Big Shot, you're acting like you know things, right? And in reality, you're, you know, you're, uh, you know, you're, you're kind of sending your clients out to do the things you're too afraid to do. If they come back alive, maybe you'll give it a try. <laughs> Kara, would you like to have the final word? Sure, Lou. Um, I just want to thank you for holding the space for me to go to that vulnerable place. and. Um, I really, I found 
the metaphors and images really helpful. And I loved your humor too. It really helped me just to feel connected to you somehow. Yeah. So thank you so much. And thanks to everyone. It's really beautiful to just hear what was touched in each of you. And thanks so much to everyone. <laughs> and the beautiful thing is you're struggling with your sense of being present and everyone is experiencing your presence and loving you. We, <laughs> we just have to figure out how to get you to get that message. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. You too, Kira. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much. Well, thanks everyone. Uh, Liam, I think we've hit we've hit our time. Yeah, <clears throat> we're we're on the time, Lou. So so really, thank you. It was super. And um, if I had time, I'd go through all the comments. There's just been a lot of really nice comments um, directed towards yourself and directed towards Kira. So thanks for that. Wonderful. And a big thanks to Kira and Brenda and Carly and Robert and Brendan and Helma. And Robert and Mary, who are in the background. So in, in February now, you have your first volunteer, Lou. So Robert is going to do it, I think. I think after what you said to him tonight, he'll be more than eager. <laughs> have an ambulance standing by. <laughs> <laughs> and, and thanks to everybody that joined. And I hope to see everybody in February. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll probably hopefully talk to you before Christmas, Lou, and have a happy Thanksgiving next Thursday. All right. Thank you. Same, same to happy holidays to all of you. <laughs> <laughs>